Lord, we do thank you for your kindness. Lord, we do thank you for your mercy. I thank you for the church that you've allowed me to be in this morning. I thank you for the privilege of being able to stand before your people. We ask now, Lord God, that you would clear our hearts and minds of every thought, every word, every deed, every action that has not uh, met your will and your good pleasure. We ask you to renew us afresh. And Lord, we need you to give us illumination of what you've already said. So that, Lord God, as we walk with you, you would be glorified. And all of the congregation edified and the devil horrified as we stand together in oneness to your glory. We love you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. We were riding around uh, in the city, and as we were riding around, we kept hearing a, a noise in the car, and we couldn't figure out what the noise meant, but we knew from the noise that I was not doing something right. And so every time we figured out, whenever I get too close to a car, it would beep, 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 beep. And so I, I didn't realize with this new car that that's what was happening. So we got out the door out there, and um, we didn't close the trunk all the way. And so as I was trying to lock it, this long beep like, man, you dummy, what are you doing? It was like, beep, beep, dummy, 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 dummy. You know, it was, it was very loud. And, and you know, we kind of stood around and said, now, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And what I realized is that certain noises give you an indication that something is wrong. Does that make sense to you? And, and, and you kind of know it when you hear it, you know, the, the dumb noise, the womp, womp, womp. I mean, just <laughs> all those things, they indicate that there is something wrong. Well, there is something that I want you to think about this morning is that sometimes you and I can have noise in our souls. And when you have a noise in your soul, God has so orchestrated our lives that a noisy soul is an indication that something is wrong. And what I want to do is I want to give you some ideas of a moment of kind of what a noisy soul looks like. And then from there, I want us to look at the prescription that God has given in his word for a noisy soul. And then I want to look at the promise that we can embrace from God for a noisy soul. Would you like to explore that with me this morning? Think about this. I think you have this in your notes with you. But one of the premises of a noisy soul is that you are bombarded with thoughts bombarded with thoughts. And I want to give you some descriptions of some of the thoughts that kind of engage your mind when your soul is noisy. One of the thoughts that we will experience when we have a noisy soul is the noise of guilt. And when we talk about this guilt, it's the awareness in your soul that you have done something wrong. And it makes you very downcasted in your mind. Have you ever been there? You, you, you just, you're trying to get away from it, but the noise is so loud in your soul and you know in your heart you've done something wrong. But secondly, there's another kind of noise that when you're not right with God and others, it shows up. And this is this noise that we can call a fear of God's judgment. You ever just had this impending sense that something was about to happen? You, you just knew that you were going to get it and you, you could feel uncomfortable no matter what was going on around you. You just felt as if judgment for you was coming. Am I the only one that's ever had that happen or can anybody else identify with that reality? All right, I got hands. Amen. I don't feel alone. Good. And, and sometimes when your soul is noisy, this can happen. But not only do we have this noise of guilt or this fear of judgment, sometimes I know for me, there's this noise in my heart that says, let's just get away from it all. Let's just chunk it away. I mean, there have been times where, have you ever seen that Southwest commercial that says, want to get away? <laughs> well, I will never forget, I was sitting at this church. I was in, where was I? It was somewhere in Washington. And this lady I thought was pregnant. <laughs> And I said, oh, wow, trying to be nice. When is the baby due? <laughs> and she ignored me like she didn't hear me. And I guess I thought maybe I wasn't speaking loud. I said, so, ma'am, when is the baby due? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, I am not pregnant. <laughs> and at that moment, I just wanted to get away. <laughs> it was like, it's over now. She's not going to hear anything I have to say for the rest of the time. But... What I recognize is sometimes in our souls, when 
things are not right with God and not right with others, we can hear this kind of noise. The noise of guilt, the, the fear of judgment, the noise of just wanting to escape from it all because I just don't want to face the reality of what's happening. But secondly, I've discovered this. When one has a noisy soul, you will also see that it's trying to control the good and the bad in life instead of enjoying and enduring the good and bad in life. You ever been in that place where stuff is so good and you just, you want to hang on to it and you don't want to let it go, but it's not in your hands to hold on to it. And before you know it, you're so troubled in your heart because you just want to keep it, but then there are bad things that happen. You just want to escape from it and it's so difficult and you wish God would just let you out of it, but God's plan is bigger than your pain in that moment, but you don't realize it. And sometimes we can have a noisy soul because we don't know how to enjoy and endure. What I tell people in marriage counseling is this, you need to enjoy your spouse, endure your spouse, but live for Jesus with your spouse. Because too often we don't enjoy enough because we're waiting for the bottom to fall out and we're complaining in the pain because we're so consumed with ourselves, we're not living for Jesus. And there are times in our lives when our souls are noisy because we're not learning to enjoy the good and endure the bad. We're trying to control all of it and that can bring a noisy soul. But thirdly, there are times in our lives where we have a noisy soul because we're trying to reduce life to something specific. And and let me share this with you if you would hear me out for a moment. A noisy soul is caused by trying to reduce life to what you want, what you think you need, and living by what you think is right and what you think is wrong, resulting in living a life of either self-indulgence or self-righteousness, which is all just self-centeredness. Do you know the difference between the two sons? You remember the story of the prodigal son? You remember that story? Well, all the people in church are going, yeah, those self-indulgent people, look at them, look at them. And all the self-indulgent people look at the folk in the church and go, yeah, all those self-righteous people, look at them. They both have one thing in common, self-centered. And and sometimes we have noisy souls because we have made life very, very personal. Personal. How many of you have heard of the station WIIFM? Does anyone know that station? It is a universal station. It's around the globe. I mean, everybody is tuned in to WIIFM. Did you not know that? This is news to you. Can I tell you what it stands for? What's in it for me. Everyone around the world is tuned into W-I-I-F-M. And when that happens, you go into extremes. You're self-righteous, self-indulgent, and that will create a noisy soul. If we were to summarize it all together, if you would look with me, a noisy soul, in essence, is trying to live life without God. When you find yourself with a noisy soul, somewhere in some aspect of your life, you have chosen to live without God. And guess what? You become preoccupied with your own cares, your own riches, your own worries, and and the standards that are leading you to, watch this, being weary tired from that hard toil and heavy laden. Why? Because you are burdened down with either trying to save yourself by your own righteousness or you're burdened down with trying to live for yourself and your own self-indulgence and you are overwhelmed. Sometimes in our lives, guys, we can have a noisy, noisy soul. Have you ever been in a room? They don't have them now. Now everything is so updated. But back when I was growing up, they had the chalkboards. Now you got the, uh, what do you call it? The blackboard or the, what is that thing? uh, What is it called? No, 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 the electronic one now. Smart board. Yeah, see that, the black, see some of you are my age, so you're taking like I'm thinking. No, 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 I'm talking about the the new stuff now, the smart board where you get the, you know, the little thing and I'm still learning how to use that stuff, but back in my day you had the chalkboard and and you remember there always that one kid that liked to put his fingers on the board, you know what I'm talking about, and just, 
you know, and that noise would drive you crazy, or the guy that couldn't hold the chalk right, and every time he would write it, would, and you'd be like, somebody give this man a bigger piece of chalk or something. You, you, you know what I mean? If you've ever been there. But in all those cases, what's happening is when that guy is writing, he's writing in the wrong way. He's, he's not using the chalk the way it was meant to be used. And that's what happens with us, guys. A noisy soul is because we're trying to live our lives in a way God did not design. And what does that produce? A bunch of noise. So if we summarize it this way, we could say this. A noisy soul is a soul that is downcasted, that is doubtful, that is devastated, that's divided, and devoid of peace as a result of trying to live life without depending on and submitting to our almighty God. How do we quiet a noisy soul? How do we take the reality of God's word and begin to experience the peace that transcends all understanding? I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, the one gospel that reveals the kingdom of God in very detailed and reveals God as the king. And we come to chapter 11, he's been talking about the curse and the rejection of these particular cities for rejecting him and who he is. And he was praying to the father about keeping these things from those who are seemingly intelligent and exposing that to those who are infants and that he's been given the authority to reveal the father And then we come to verse 28 and verses 30. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. We're going to see the distinction between being given rest and finding rest. There's a distinction that is very, very crucial for us. And then he says in verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want us to take a few moments now. We've looked at the premise of a noisy soul. I, I want to talk about God's prescription for a noisy soul. And we've got four essential things that God gives us as a prescription for a noisy soul. And then we'll come back and we'll see the promises if we abide by the prescription. How many of you have had medicine that you didn't take? Anybody? And then you're wondering why you still have those aches and pains. Does that make sense? And they, the doctor told you exactly what to do and showed you how to do it. And you said, yeah, okay. And then when life moved on, you didn't feel as bad as you did before. You didn't take it. And then the pain comes back and you go, where's that medicine? What's, what's going on? God has given us a prescription that says, listen, you don't have to have a noisy soul. You don't have to live that quality of existence. But you've got to take my prescription. The first part of this prescription we see again is in verse 28. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. The first point we see is that God calls us to come to him, to come to him. What is he referring to in this particular aspect of coming to him? In this aspect, he's telling us to establish a right relationship with him. All who are weary, all who are heavy laden. This is a call to salvation. If your soul is heavy and noisy and you have not put your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, he says, come to me. Come on in. I know you are sick of the self-righteousness because you're still as ugly as when you started and the harder you try, the uglier you get because you're trying to keep the law. Come to me. I know you, you are so sick and tired. You're full of yourself to where you don't even like you anymore. You're so self-indulgent. Come to me. I will give you rest. The first part of the prescription is a call to salvation. But here's what's beautiful about the Lord. That's the initial calling of God. But notice the second part of the prescription. He says, now take my yoke 
upon you. What? What is he talking about? He's calling us to discipleship. Take my yoke. So, letter B, God calls us to take his yoke. That is to submit to Jesus Christ in discipleship. This is a call to sanctification. So, notice the first part of the prescription is, come to me. Come on. I'll deliver you from your self-righteousness, your self-indulgence. Come to me. I'll give you some rest. But guess what? Now that I have saved you, I want you to now come take my yoke. Learn from me. I didn't save you to sit around and be the same person. I tell people all the time, you can come as you are, but I guarantee if you stay around here long enough, you won't stay as you are. Because we're going to love you too much with God's will and ways. We're going to love you too much with his word. We're going to impart to you truth that will so be infectious that you'll want to know and embrace more of this Trinitarian fellowship with God. Come to me. But don't just come. I want you to learn from me. So in the prescription, it's come, salvation. Take my yoke sanctification. But notice there are two central things that he's calling for us to consider. Notice he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am. Two things we see here. I am gentle and I am humble. Two things that God wants us to learn to consider in our sanctification, in our discipleship. One is that he's gentle and he wants us to learn that gentleness. So let's get a working definition from this context of what he means by gentleness. A willing submission from the heart to the rule of God over your life without grumbling or resisting. A willing submission to the agenda of God. I need you to learn to be gentle as I am. I'm not resistant to God's will. I'm not resistant to God's way. And I want you to learn to be that way. How many of you have this in your premise? I will obey God if or until. Now, you don't say it, you live it. You will never outright say, I will obey God if he does this or until this happens. But when the pressures of life and the circumstances around you arise, And if your view and relationship with God is not as strong as the pressure and pains around you, you will find yourself not submitting to what you know to be true, but doing that which you know is wrong. Why? Because you want relief more than you're willing to endure the pain that God has brought in your life for transformation of your soul. And the question we have to ask is, have we learned to be gentle? as the son was with the father. Have we learned to not resist the will of God? Not to resist his ways, but to be willing to follow as he would desire. This is one of the things that Jesus says, in your sanctification, I want you to learn this of me. But here's the second thing I want you to see. God also says, not only is he gentle, but he's humble. God calls us to learn humility from him. What is this humility? It's a willing disposition from the heart and a willing practice to esteem others above yourself. A willingness to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and not make a name for yourself. Can I ask you a question? How important are you to you? Be honest. You love you some you, don't you? When you wake up in the morning, who's the first person on your mind? When you're going through the day, who's the first person on your mind? When things don't go the way you want, who's the first person on your mind? You know what God is saying? I need to teach you to get over yourself and get under me and not focus on what is being done to you, but focus on how I'm being glorified through you. Instead of focusing on, Lord, why did you not focus on, Lord, what are you trying to teach me from what you've allowed? I 
I need you to understand that your life is now in my hands. And if you are gentle and allow me to lead you, and if you're humble and you just recognize that it's not important to be recognized, but let me be recognized and I'll exalt you at the proper time. One of the beauties of surrendering to the Trinitarian fellowship that we have with God is that you and I no longer have to look out for ourselves. And one of the beauties is that we don't have to be so consumed with what people think of us, we can be consumed with the reality of how God loves us. And once we begin to have this mindset, there's a humility that we can develop in that says, you never have to know my name, but I'm gonna make sure you know his name. That's your question. Are you learning gentleness? Are you learning humility? So notice the prescription that we see for a noisy soul. Number one, come to me, call to salvation. Number two, learn of me, take my yoke, call to sanctification. And there are two things that I want you to learn in general. I want you to learn my gentleness. I want you to learn my humility. I want you to know me, not just intellectually, but I want you to know the reality of my presence as I deliver you from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and one day the presence of sin. And as I commune with you, as you submit your life to me, you will experience my joy in abundance, my peace in abundance. I want you to know me. I want to deliver you from your self-righteousness and your self-indulgence, but you've got to come to me. The story is told of this pastor. He was a younger guy. He had just came out of the cemetery. I mean the seminary. (laughs) Some of you seminarians that catch what I just did. And he had all of this good insight in his mind, and he was excited about everything he had learned. And that was an older guy. He didn't have as much training as this younger guy. And there was a church that was looking for a pastor. And so the committee got down to these two key guys. And the younger guy, he felt like he was a shoe-in because it was a, you know, church that he felt like he could handle and he had enough wisdom and insight. The much older guy, he was just wanting to see what the Lord would do. So they had a task, and the task was to both preach on Psalm 23. So the younger guy got up and said, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. And he got up and he began to expound on the construct of the Hebrew. And I mean, he broke down the word verse by verse and people listened to him and said, I don't know what he's talking about, but he sure sounds good talking about it. The elderly guy got up, took the same verse, same passages and He didn't wax as eloquently as the younger guy, but he was able to get to the point in ways that really connected with the people. And you saw people coming and wanting salvation, people wanting to begin to grow in their relationship with God. And the younger guy said, now, wait a minute. And he went over to the older guy and said, now, listen, I'm not trying to be arrogant here, but I know I preach that way better than you. But I got to know something. What did you do? He said, son, you know the 23rd Psalm, but I know the shepherd. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants us to not just know his word, but the reality of his presence that comes through submission to his word. He wants us to know him. He wants us to become like him. He wants us to be useful to him. God is calling us not to a legalistic ritual thing that this is what I do now. This is when I have my devotion. This is when I, no, 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 no. God says, I want to deliver you from your existence to a quality of life that will transform you forever that starts now and ends in eternity. But you've got to come to me. You've got to submit to me and as you do this I will make myself known to you some people intellectually know the grace of God and some people are experiencing the reality of that grace some people can pontificate on the sovereignty and the sufficiency of God and others are experiencing the reality of the sovereignty and sufficiency of God It's not enough to know the word of God. It's more to just knowing it. It's experiencing the reality. And that's the kind of life 
that God is calling you and I too when he says, come to me. Salvation, take my yoke, learn of me. Sanctification, learn these two things from me. Let me summarize this section by saying this. This is in your notes. We must come to Jesus Christ to receive our salvation. We must walk with Jesus Christ in our sanctification. We must learn the nature of our God and love to seek him accordingly, letting the mind of the master be the master of our minds. This is the kind of life that God has called you and I to. And it starts with the simple reality of coming to him. Well, we've looked at the premise of a noisy soul. We've looked at the prescription of a noisy soul. I want us to go back to this passage and let's explore the promises that come if we follow the prescription. Look with me back at 11:28. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Now that's very important because we're gonna distinguish the rest that we see in verse 28 from the rest that we see in verse 29. There's a distinction between these two rests and it's so important for you and I to catch what God is showing us in this text. So this giving of rest, we will be given rest. Watch this, Christ's saving work is to give rest for our souls if we come to him. What is this rest? To be refreshed, to be revived in soul from spiritual death to spiritual life through salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, watch this, guys. We can define this rest as peace with God. Peace with God. Well, what do we mean by peace with God? Legally declared right with God, this rest is given through salvation. Now, I want you to walk with me for a moment. Keep your finger in Matthew 11 and walk with me just a moment to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, because this is very important for us that in our salvation, which is giving us justification, we have peace with God that will never, ever, ever ever, can I keep the repeat button going, ever change. This is a time to say amen, by the way. Amen. All right, I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, notice it didn't say peace of God. It says we have peace with God our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand Ladies and gentlemen, the one thing that we gain by coming to God in salvation is that we get this peace with God. We are reconciled with God. He's no longer angry with us. He will never be against us. We never have to worry about our sins counting against us. God will discipline us to make us like him. We don't have to worry about the punishment of hell. We just endure the discipline and it's for correction because he loves us. You and I never have to worry about being outside of God's grace and favor. When we come to God, we get peace with God. That is a promise from God. But I need you to see something here. Let's go back to Matthew 11 because this peace is given. The other is found. And there's a distinction here. Notice what he says. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Now, through this sanctification process, he says, take my yoke and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest. Well, what's the difference between being given rest and finding rest? Notice where finding rest comes. It is hinged on learning and practicing what God has given. Learn of me. And when God is talking about learning, he's not talking about just intellectually saying, oh yeah, now I get it. I see that now. He's talking about not only gaining the insight, but applying the insight. And there's something that comes that's different than the rest in verse 28 that comes in 29 when you take what he says and you put it to practice. Letter B, here's the promise, you will find rest. What do we mean here? Inward tranquility 
while one performs necessary labor for our souls if we follow him. What does that mean? Relief from anxiety and trouble, relief from the pain of guilt as we walk in progressive sanctification in Jesus Christ. This rest can be defined as the peace of God. Tranquility of soul as a result of following Jesus Christ, this rest is gained through sanctification. Now, let me walk with you because you don't gain peace with God. You are given peace with God. That comes by salvation. But the peace of God, the tranquility of soul, is something that is maintained or derailed by obedience or disobedience. We never lose peace with God. We lose the peace of God because when you sin, the relationship is there, but the fellowship is broken and you have this noise in your soul. Not because you're no longer a Christian, but you have it because somewhere in your life you've stopped listening and learning from the master. Now watch this. Would you really obey God if you had peace in sin? Let that sink in. Would you really obey God if you could stay in sin and your soul, you'd have tranquility of soul? You would be in all kinds of stuff. God has so orchestrated a relationship with him that says, when you lose peace, it's never peace with me that you lose. It's the peace of me that you lose when you don't live what I've trained you to live and empowered you to live. You lose the peace of God when you walk in sin. But when you walk in what's right, guess what? It comes back again. But you never lose the peace with God. Let me see if I can show that to you. Let me read the rest of this. This rest, uh, again, can be defined as the peace of God, tranquility of soul as a result of following Jesus Christ. This rest is gained through sanctification. Let me give an example of this. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 for just a moment. Philippians chapter 4. Keep your finger there. And let's go to Philippians 4. Let's look at verses 6 to verses 9 for a moment. And what a powerful thing Paul tells us in this Philippians chapter 4. I like to call this the principles of peace. There's a formula here. Can I give you the formula of what it says? Proper prayer plus a proper perspective plus proper practice produces perfect peace. Now, let me say it again. Proper prayer plus proper perspective plus proper practice produces peace perfect peace. Now, let me see if I can prove that premise to you. Look with me at Philippians chapter 4. Notice what he says. We see the proper prayer first. He says in verse 8, well, let's go to verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace with God or of God. Very different. We'd have a different gospel if that was a peace with God. You never lose that. But with proper prayer, it says, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brother, that's the proper prayer. Now look at the proper perspective. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything is worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Proper perspective. Look at verse 9. Proper practice. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, simple reality. Coming to Christ, you will get the peace with God. Walking with Christ You get the peace of God. What is the one thing that everyone lacks when they're in trouble? Peace. From a biblical counseling perspective, no one in my life of counseling have ever come to me and said, Pastor, I've got so much peace and I I need to talk to you because I've just got so much peace in my heart. (laughs) Have you had anyone ever come to you with just so much peace in their heart that... You know, they just want to, they need counsel because they've had, anybody in the room? No hands. 
And I've been sharing this for years that I've yet to get one hand because you know what? It's not reality. What's the one thing that everyone lacks in their troubles? It's peace. But see, you and I have to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Do they lack peace with God? Or do they lack the peace of God? And so through wise counsel and figuring things out, there are many times when people are lacking peace, I recognize you've not yet come to the master to be delivered from your sin. Let me give you the true gospel of God that can deliver you from your sin and put you in a right relationship and ultimately fellowship with this Trinitarian God that we serve. Let me lead you to this relationship with God. And guess what? At that moment, you will have peace that you've never had before. But watch this. That's peace with him. Let me show you how to experience the peace of him now as you start to live a new life in fellowship with him. Now, if I'm dealing with a person I recognize they belong to Jesus Christ, then I know they don't like peace with God. What are they lacking? The peace. So they've stopped living what they know to be true. And somewhere I have to lead them through the process of confession, the process of repentance, and the process of replacing that which is wrong with that which is right so that they begin to experience the genuine fellowship with God again, which brings about that peace of God. This is a powerful reality when we understand that the one central thing that we can share with people is when there's a lack of peace, there's a promise of how you can gain it and a promise of how you can maintain this peace with God. But we have to be clear, there's one that you don't work for and the other you just develop in. You don't work for your salvation, it's given to you and you get peace with him. But when you live with God, he gives you the peace of him, a tranquility of soul that stabilizes you to handle the pressures and the problems and the predicaments and all the things of life. We don't need more than God's word. We need more of God's word. And when you and I are on troubled times and difficulties and there's a lack of peace, if we belong to him, we trace it back to the areas of our lives where we've stopped living what we've learned. And as we no longer make excuses, but make confessions and repent and replace, we can begin to have the peace to endure the troubles and trials and and things of our lives and begin to walk in a manner worthy and find stability even in the midst of a storm. But ultimately, our souls will no longer be noisy. So those are two of the promises that we see. Look at the rest of this. Let's look at verse 30. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we come to God, salvation, walk with him, sanctification, he promises my yoke will be easy, my burden will be light. What does it mean that my yoke will be easy? What he's saying to you and I is that his agenda for discipleship is well fitted for you. It's suited for you. It's adapted for you. As you submit to the agenda of God's purpose, his purpose is fulfilled in you and through you. And watch this. You will have pleasantness of soul and bring glory to God. My yoke is easy. In other words, you can do this because you're yoked to me. I'm not asking you to do anything I have empowered you to do. You say, can you show me chapter and verse? You're looking at me strange. See, the longer you look at me strange, I got to go to more verses because you're looking like you don't believe me here. See, that just adds five more minutes to the sermon. I'm just telling you, okay? Do you understand? Amen. There you go. <laughs> the yoke is easy. Think about it this way. Philippians says, it is God who is at work in you. Therefore, work out. We're not commanded to do anything that he's not empowering or walking alongside of us to do. That is why a disobedient Christian is not one who lacks power, is one who is in rebellion and lacks the willingness to do what they have the power to do. As I shared that with this group uh, yesterday, there's three reasons why a Christian does not obey God. And there's only three. For unbelievers, we understand why they don't obey God. It's called sin. 
They're slaves to sin. But you who have been delivered from the penalty, the power, and one day presence of sin, there's only three reasons why you don't obey God. Number one is this, lack of knowledge. I just didn't know. Number two, lack of skill. I knew, but I just didn't know how. And then number three, lack of will. I know, I know how, but you know what? I ain't doing that. No. Okay. That's why there's a lack of peace in your life. So when I'm dealing with Christians, I I start to figure out, is this a lack of knowledge? Is this a lack of skill? Or is this a lack of will? And then it determines how I can engage them. Because if it's a lack of knowledge and lack of skill, we just need to give them more insight. We need to give them ways to put it to practice. If it's a lack of will, it's called a kind and nice rebuke. And where the kind and nice rebuke, there's a continuance of stubbornness, it's called the CD word. Does everybody know what the CD word is? It's two words. Church discipline. I can't fight stubbornness. There's no counsel for stubbornness. There's no counsel for rebellion. But the only key is, Lord, please, may you use this as an opportunity to restore them so that they see the need for you and the need for this communal relationship in order to know you, to become like you, to be useful to you. Lord, this is not punitive. This is to say we have no more resources So we have to let you go and experience the consequences and allow God to do whatever he's going to do in hopes that he will bring you to your senses. God says, my yoke is easy. But here's the next thing he says, and my burden is light. What does he mean by this? The load God has for you to carry in terms of the demands of discipleship will not be more than what you can handle. It will be bearable and not a burden. You will be able to carry the load without it weighing you down. There was this man who had these sacks of potatoes on his shoulders. And he was walking and it was tough. It was a heavy load he was carrying. And as he was carrying this heavy load, his friend came by with a little wagon. He was riding the wagon. He said, man, hop on the back. I'll take you where you want to go. It looked like you're struggling. So the guy jumped on the back of the wagon. Whereas his friend was driving the wagon, he heard his friend groaning in the background. And he looked around, and his friend still had the sack of potatoes on his shoulders. He said, hey, man, put the potatoes down. I got you. I'm carrying you where you need to go. Let me paraphrase what Jesus is saying to you. Hey, man, put the potatoes down. I got you. I got you. Will you let Jesus carry you? But see, the thing of Jesus carrying you, he wants you to be in part as he's doing it. It requires your submission for him to carry you. In other words, he saved you. He's transforming you, but he wants you involved in the process. And where there's a lack of peace in your life, there's a lack of development in your sanctification if you're a Christian. Where there's a lack of peace in your life, you're not a Christian, it's a call to come to this God that we serve. Let me close with this summary, if you would look with me in your notes. Through salvation, you will be given rest, peace with God. Through sanctification, you will find rest, the peace of God. The lifestyle and responsibility God gives, teaches and commands you to walk in will not be burdensome or more than what you can handle. It has been tailor-made and well-fitted for you. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you that you solved our peace problem. We thank you that we didn't have to do anything, you did it. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to earn our salvation or earn our sanctification. You've called us to you and you've empowered us to walk with you. May we evaluate the areas where we lack peace 
and begin to make the necessary adjustments in our lives to come to you, whether it be salvation, or to come to you, whether it be sanctification, that we may find your rest and that we may gain your rest. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.